Meet the intrepid crew of the rogue trader vessel Emperor's Humor 2 as they face the horrors of the warp and void, bravely assembled for their next perilous mission. Lunch! What's up, everybody? Welcome to your Munitorum mandated lunch break. This is the Munitorum Break Room podcast. I've got Gingy and Tiki the Hut with me today. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Gingy. Howdy, howdy. It's Tiki. And as this is our first episode, we're going to get started with a little bit of introductions. Um, here at the Munitorum Break Room, I'd like to ask three questions uh, Who are you? What brought you? And what keeps you? So, First off, you can take it away, Gingy. Well, what brought you? Who are you? Well, my name's Gingy. I work as a butcher here in this little no-name town that I live in. That's that's about who I am. This is kind of all that I do. What brought me? Um, like what 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 brought you to tabletop gaming or war gaming or gaming in general? I mean, what what drew you in? Well, gaming in general. That's a that's a very broad umbrella that you could throw down, but. You know, gaming in general, it gives you a way to escape into something that isn't stressful. You're not you're not worried about bills. You're not worried about whatever's going on in your life. You're, you know, you're, the only thing that you're worried about is what's immediately in front of you. And then what brought me to tabletop gaming is that it's completely different from regular gaming. You know, if you, if you do a normal gaming session with somebody, mm -hmm. you know, over... Online. Yeah, online gaming, which, of course, there's nothing wrong with online gaming. Don't get me wrong. I play a lot of the games that I play on the tabletop online because there's so many resources available now. But the tabletop gaming gives you something different that online gaming doesn't. It gives you that face-to-face -face interaction. You know, I used to sit in my room for weeks on end where I didn't actually interact with another person because I would, I thought that I was. I thought that I was playing with them, you know, I thought I was playing with other people, mm -hmm. but it turns out that you're not, it's not the same as being face to face. Mm -hmm. You like then, the community aspect of it. Yeah, you? the community is a big thing that comes into play when you, you're doing a tabletop game. And then, not to mention, when you get all of the toxicity and all of we've all had trolls or oh, yeah. you know we've all had just back under your bridge troll yeah exactly. yeah we've all had you know teammates that are less than favorable on your team that mm -hmm. are saying god only knows what to you the worst version of get good scrub yeah the, the absolute worst version you know there there are so many things that can happen online when you're not actually face to face that I found that don't happen when you're doing a tabletop game. When you're playing Magic, and Magic is what got me into, I guess, what you could say, a first tabletop game. There's no miniatures, there's no, there's nothing like that, but it brings a community of people together and you're playing in tournaments at a, just a little hobby shop is all that I had. And you know, you're all there to play one game you see each other, you communicate, and you're only four foot away from that guy. So he can reach you. Yeah, he can reach you, exactly. There's only so many things that that other person is gonna say. You don't get that same toxicity. You don't get the same negativity that you can get if you get, you know, that you get with an online game. And it almost brings you back to like, when you're playing Monopoly, sitting around, because I mean, I don't know about the kids nowadays, but when I was a kid, you didn't have all these different online games that you play with. You know, if we wanted to pull out a board game, we pulled out Monopoly, we pulled out Sorry, we pulled out whatever board game you had at the time, and it was different at whoever's house you were at. That's kind of what brought me into tabletop gaming, was that it's, it's a little bit different than just gaming in general. It's a, to use an archaic term, it's kind of a gentleman's agreement. So you are there to, you agree that you're there to do the same thing. We're abiding by a certain number of rules. There, there's expectations. You actually have to shower. Nobody can smell you through the mic yeah, online. That's true. The technology is not there and by God, I hope it never gets there. But it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things that you, you have to be acceptable. You have to be, um, 
you have to be a person that you, where you don't have to be a person online. Everybody's just a, a, a little green name. Yeah. Where you, you know, you're shooting that person down. Oh, well, and whatever. But the for me, the whole tabletop aspect of it is you're it's almost like when you're sitting down and playing chess, there's a certain amount of decorum. Mm -hmm. There's a certain amount of um, there's respect there, even though I mean, not always, of course, but in a, in a good gaming group or even most, you're going to have a level of, you know, good game, shake hands, sportsmanship that's not involved with any kind of online game. Yeah. Like there's, there's no sportsmanship. There's no handshake after you don't chat about, you know, your strategy. There's no growth really. Well, you just jump to the next game. Yeah. You, you don't, you don't actually have to sit down and set your minis down or shuffle your deck or you don't have to do anything that involves the other person. You just hit next game and that that's it. So what keeps you in the tabletop hobby? When, what, what, keep, what keeps you grounded? Um, I feel like it's the, the sense of community that you really gain from sitting across with somebody else, you know, being, you know, we're not thousands of miles away. We're four foot away from each other. I could touch you from across the table. Something about that, that sense of community is really what grounds you into the tabletop scene. It's, it's different than anything else I've ever done. It really, I mean, even if you're playing a tournament, you've got 20 guys, they're all 20 people, sorry, excuse me, all playing, you know, you, you all end up conversing. You have conversations about who you are, what you do outside of this while you're waiting on your turn to hopefully beat the other guys, beat the other guys ass at what you're doing. And then even if you do win, lose, draw, whatever it comes out as, you end up having a conversation about the game that you just played, about the strategy, about what brought you there, about what, about what faction or what cards or whatever it is that you're playing. There's whatever. this opportunity to learn that's not there when you just hit go next game. Yeah, there's there's not a just next game button and you're hoping that you might talk to that person later. You're with that person in the same building for God knows how many hours playing a tournament. And that's what keeps me here is really the sense of community, how many people are open to teaching, how many people are open to talking about it. Really, it's there's there's so many open books when it comes to tabletop gaming, and there's so much to learn. There's not the gatekeeping. You're not good enough. You're not. You, you're you're gonna run into some of that anywhere, really. But the I find the vast majority of people that are in this hobby, they're just genuinely happy to be there. They're happy to have that community and they're really willing to just jump in and share. Like guys like uh, Morning Boy. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, I know that guy. Yeah, you know that guy. Uh, he's kind of, he's actually what brought me and Tiki together. Just being in his chats and his streams and everything, you post something on stream discussion. Like if you're, if you made a spicy meme or you've been, you've been painting something, anything like that, the community will just rally around you and support you. And it's, it's beautiful. That's a rare thing to find as and I'm not trying to exclude anybody, but as a as a man in the world that we live in, it's hard to find that sense of community, that sense of support, and just almost like love in the tabletop community. It's and a big it, bromance. Yeah, it's a big old bromance. And I mean, there's not much judgment. It's all just love for somebody being into the same thing that you are. And that's true, but I think what I really like, particularly about that community, is and speaking, I guess, more towards being guys, of course, I'm sure there's girls and nerds as well. Is it's also a good place to kind of get checked if you want. You can volunteer, be like, hey, guys, I'm thinking about taking this list. You know, it's like, am I the asshole? Or, and they're like, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty Mimi, bro. You might want to change that. Like, oh, okay, cool. Or you can literally say like, hey, I saw a guy doing this. Ugh, should I call him out? Be like, nah, nah, it's probably not the best action to take. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a good way to literally kind of almost kind of check yourself like am i am i being you know a chad am i being like a, that guy you know it, it's a good place to not just you're not just going there for affirmation people tell you like oh you're amazing you know oh gee thanks it's also a place to be like hey did i mess up you're like yeah you messed up that's pretty terrible or like nah man i was totally the other guy so that's the kind of cool part is it's basically a really good way to kind of a good wall to bounce stuff off of yeah you get a lot of honesty out of this community 
and people will tell you if you were wrong or if you were the asshole. Yeah, and you know, most of the time, the, the, those the people that aren't okay with that tend to gatekeep themselves out because they can't deal with it. Mm -hmm. So you end up with this like forged community of people that are, hey, I, tell me if I'm being an ass, and you know, if I am, then I'll try to change, or I'll be really mad about it and get, get gatekeep myself out. But I mean, just the beauty of having that community is just so important. So. Moving over to you, Tiki. Who are you? What brought you? What keeps you in the game? Howdy, howdy. It's your old pal, Tiki the Hutt. Uh, who I am, really not as interesting. <laughs> I'm just, I'm a beat up old 30-year-old. Uh, I'm a veteran. Uh, I married another veteran. So we lived the whole life. Now we're just kind of being quiet and hiding away. Um, I actually do have a YouTube channel. I put out a lot of stuff, mostly about Conflict 47, because I find it super interesting. But I'll cover other stuff like uh, Bolt Action, Gas Land Zone Alpha, maybe some Fallout, we'll see. Um, as far as what really kind of brought me into it, um, I grew up a uh, family, mom, dad, two older brothers, and I was always the youngest. Obviously, you know, it doesn't change outside of time machines. But the point is, is what I loved about tabletop wargaming once I was old enough to kind of understand and, and read is it was a neutral battlefield. So, you know, I grew up playing Magic. Now, this wasn't the type of Magic the Gathering. I think you'll see it all the other card stores. This was, we'd pull our allowance, go out and get a deck. You know, we all had our colors. We'd split the deck up and then we'd hold like a three-way battle, which, you know, politics come into it. Like, are we going to gang up and take down this guy? Or if you do this, I'll back you up. So there's a lot of politics involved and we, and we pulled our cards. So we knew what everybody had. Like, I, I know what you have. You know, I'm just waiting for that goblin to pop up. And you played tons of games like... Hero Quest. I grew up playing Hero Quest with my dad and my brothers. Dragon Strike. If you're watching this right now and you get a chance, open up another window on YouTube and and look up the Dragon Strike video. It's cheesy and perfection. So I played a lot of tabletop games like that. Um, what drew me into competitive tabletop board gaming was uh, Battlefleet Gothic. I think a lot like Beardo. I'm a huge lore guy. I love theme. I love lore and I love immersion. So I read a lot of the books for Warhammer 40k before I ever got financially stable enough to buy the models. So my intro, I got a really good deal, was Battlefleet Gothic, and that was super cool. I remember playing at a tournament where at one table we had a Battlefleet Gothic game going on, and whoever won that game got to drop down orbital bombardments on the Warhammer 40k games going on on the other tables. So I kind of like that immersion, that's what really drew me into tabletop wargaming. As far as uh, what keeps me in tabletop wargaming, um, honestly, and you guys you guys hit on it earlier, that's why I didn't want to jump in and disrupt that, uh, that synergy. Is it's it's a whole nother world when you're actually see people face to face, and not like an intimidation factor. Uh, I know we were talking earlier. I was talking, you know. I also grew up playing you know card games like everybody does, uh, especially in the service. But um, when you play poker, online poker is wildly different from actually sitting across the green felt and looking at your opponent and playing poker. It, it's two entirely separate games. Um, I mentioned earlier about playing. Uh, tabletop board games with my brothers and my dad it wasn't evil even playing field is why i liked it you know when we played chess i wasn't you know f two in or two feet shorter than they were or they didn't have 100 pounds on me we had the same pieces you know that can make the same moves or when we played other board games it's a it's a way for two separate parties to enter a communal space and there's communal rules so it's kind of like an even playing field and that's i think that's really nice it's a great way to actually meet people and talk to people um and as far as why i'm still in it is it's not a dying art, but I think because of the rise, especially during the outbreak, during the rise of online gaming and online interactions, it makes personal interactions with the tabletop more worthwhile, almost like worth its weight in gold. I used to do a lot of D&D. I ran it online and I, <laughs> I noticed a complete change in uh, the amount of people who, who I would DM for in D&D during the outbreak. Uh, I don't know what happened. I don't know if it's just people got lonely. I don't know if they approached 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons like it was Build-A-Bear and they got to build their own persona and use it as free therapy. Man, I don't know, but it changed. <laughs> <laughs> so I moved on from D&D &D to go do other types of uh, wargaming. Now, to, to be honest, and I, I think Beardo will get a kick out of this personally, what really sold me, like my moment where I'm like, oh, I'm investing my time and effort to tabletop was an old guy who ran a GW store, really nice guy completely separate from, I know I say a guy runs a GW story, I once picturing something completely separate, it's on the far side of the pond. <laughs> he actually played uh, Walking Dead on his own time. That was his own time. 
and uh, he wasn't a big uh, 40k guy, but he was a great salesman. I was like, okay, well, it's a great thing. And he's really good at painting and building uh, terrain. And so one day, I, I, I guess I got into the coveted group to go to his house. He's like, do you like The Walking Dead? I was like, the show? He's like, yeah. I was like, ah, not particularly too much drama. He's like, well, come into it. You'll enjoy it. I was like, okay. So I showed up and there were drinks and, and there was this table. And guys, I'm not even kidding. It had to be like four by four, if not bigger. And if you're familiar with TT Combat style terrain, I'm talking this, was, I could show pictures later. It was a full city. Everything was detailed. I'm talking the screens on the video game cabinets, the posters, everything was painted. It was a fully detailed city. Like it looked like Raccoon City. I've never nerded out that hard. I was like, oh, this is awesome. And so we were all survivors and I ended up linking with some, ended up linking with some other guys, veterans. We used veteran tactics to get out of the city. Yeah, we gotta see those pictures later. Yeah, man. those That's... pictures have got to come. Oh but... yeah. Oh, I, I will. Oh, it was, I'm telling you right now, I, I've seen like season one before it got all drama-y and I was like, oh, this is great. Yeah, I'll just treat it like everything else. And, you know, we end up putting up a convoy and like running through zombies. And he's like, oh, I didn't think of that. Meanwhile, it's like me and three other veterans like, oh, yeah, you were just using our lingo, talking to each other. I was like, oh, this is so much fun. <laughs> and I saw the look on his face and he wasn't upset. He's like, no, this is y'all sandbox. It's like this city reacts to you. And I was like, yes, I love that. And that's how I run my game. So I used to run um, Fallout Wasteland Warfare. I mean, I made audio logs. You know, there was some gambling. You could actually do gambling at the table with like there's actual bottle caps. I'm a huge guy who likes to lean into the themes and stuff, you know, like having the physical items especially like DD campaigns, I think that's what really makes it. So that's what keeps me into uh, tabletop. Yeah, because the, the props are just there. I mean, the with the tabletop, especially like your model-based games, your props are there. So the immersion is just that much deeper immediately. Yeah, it, it gives you, everybody has their own image of whatever they're describing. And then when they pull their miniatures out or they pull out their landscape or their board, and and it gives you that precise image of what they were thinking down to, I mean, even the color scheme. Yeah, it's it's something that you just don't get when everybody's getting the exact same map or color scheme or whatever else in different forms of gaming. Man, that's the perfect way to lead into the questions for me. So I, I'm i Beardo. I, uh, there's not a lot interesting about me. I do a lot of music. Um, I'm, <laughs> Nothing interesting about you. You just play in a band. Uh, okay, I play in a I'm a bard! <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> in, insert uh, insert Cthulhu song. Everyone knows which one I'm talking about. We don't have to talk about it anymore. <laughs> but uh, so, I mean, I've, I've been doing music for a long time. I've been uh, classically trained vocalist. I've uh, been playing guitar, anything with strings, really, for about 15 years. Um, I love it. And the... You know, the technical side of it, the audio, I was a, an audio engineer for a little while, really enjoyed that. We do all our own recording. It's it's a lot of fun and I enjoyed that, but. <clears throat> wow, you're right. There's nothing interesting. Gosh, uh, well, okay. so boring. Well, it, it involves a lot of sitting in front of a computer and playing the same thing over and over and over and over again. That's kind of like what we do, you know, on a tabletop. True, true. I mean, <laughs> it, you know, it's, and really, that actually brings me into like what keeps me. I'm, I'm kind of going to go out of order here. So being in a band, you have this connection with your bandmates. And you, especially when you've been playing with guys as long as I have, I mean, me and uh, my other bandmate, uh, we've been best friends since we were in third grade. Mm -hmm. And we just, we picked up playing guitar within six months of each other. And we would sit in my living room just facing each other with the guitars. We didn't, neither of us took lessons. We would sit down during the week and like we'd talk at school about what songs we were liking. And we'd say, well, I'm gonna go home. I'm gonna try to pick that one out. Yeah. And then if we did, like we would just, we wouldn't tell each other. Like I, I would have, I would know I had this lick, right? Mm -hmm. and I would know it was gonna knock his socks off. Yeah. So I would wait <laughs> until he got there and I'd sit down with a smug grin and I'd play the lick. Now the lick would be awful because we'd been playing for six months. Yeah. But you thought it was great. Oh, it was great. And we taught each other. Yeah. It's like we're learning off of each other. Right. right. Yeah. So we built that, we built that connection that way. But any, any of you guys that you know do any kind of performance, um, any anybody that does like music, that kind of thing, will know the feeling that you get when the band is hitting together 
It's, it's almost like telepathy. I know where my bandmates are about to go. They'll think they're throwing me a curveball, but I see it a mile away and I'm already there. And again, another part of that connection is it's, it's a deep emotional connection, but without any words. So when I'm having a hard time and I'm singing some really emo song and I'm really killing it, the guys know that I'm having a hard time. Yeah. And you, as, yeah, in our society, men, we don't really talk about our mental health enough. We really should do more. But that kind of connection, the the not having to say that something is wrong and let it out in a completely just accepting environment. That kind of connection is something that I found with tabletop. Yeah, and then even when you're not saying it, if you're even if you're acting a little bit different, you're sitting right across the table from me. I can pick up on when you are... When something's you, off. Yeah, when something's different than it was. Yeah. So, yeah, I see where, I see where you're going with this. Yeah, and the, the kind of connection that you can develop with people when you're in the same room, you're doing the same thing, you have this framework that you're existing in. It's the same with music, whether you're playing a song or you're playing, you know, you're playing Kill Team. You're, you're doing the same thing, you're locked in. So you reach a deeper insight into that person's mind than you would just in conversation. Because you can't keep all those barriers up when you're, all your processing power is going to what you're doing. So you can learn a lot more about people. You learn a lot more about yourself too by the, kind of looking back and saying, okay, well, how did I handle that situation? Mm -hmm. And that, that level of learning about people, learn about yourself, and especially with the community, and what keeps me is that I get that same feeling, maybe to a different degree, the emotional level is not quite as high, mm -hmm. but I get that same camaraderie, that same, I know you. You know, I, I just saw what tactics you're going to employ, what, you know, where you're going to go, how you're going to move. Mm -hmm. It gives me an insight into that person's mind that you wouldn't get otherwise. That's a, that's a, that's a great way to put that. I think yeah. I mean, it might, might sound like a serial killer trying to analyze everybody, but it's, it, it comes from just, you know, it slowly checks the boxes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, let me, let me <laughs> scoot my chair away. Yeah. I'll scoot back just a little. <laughs> Uh, says the guy with the cleaver 24-7. <laughs> True enough, you yeah, orc. <laughs> uh, so. But, yeah, I, I get where you're going. You get a deeper connection. You get a deeper understanding. And and then I feel like just the relationships that you build over this, you, you, don't, you don't go and play more than one game with somebody and not learn something about them. And I could play... Don't get me wrong, guys. I love Fortnite. I love Call of Duty. I love Overwatch. I can play those games with you all day long and still know nothing about you as a person. Mm -hmm. But you sit me down across the table from you playing Magic, playing D&D, &D, playing Warhammer. I haven't had the chance to play Bolt Action yet, but it sounds amazing, Tiki. Yeah, we're going to get there. Yeah, you, you sit me down across from you two, three, four times on a night that we've actually made time to meet in person. And that that's a community that you've developed. That's even if it's only two, three, four people, that is your community. And it gets you out of being alone, which is something that we are, we are too much now, yes. especially after, after, after the COVID, pandemic. Yeah. We are, we are alone too much and it finally gets you into a group of people where you can be yourself and people understand you. Not only that, it's a group of people that are invested. Yeah. So like you, you have to make time, not just to play the game. You have to make time to think about how you're going to play the game. You have to make time to build the models. If you're playing a model based game, like 40 K or uh, K 47, anything like that, you have to put in the effort. And if you, I mean, you really, the depth that you go into to build your little world, your fiction, your, your little lore, whatever it is, then, you know, it's just that level of commitment 
it's almost, and this is going to be kind of a, a weird way to say it. It's almost like you're committing to someone that like, or, or like a relationship you're putting in the time and the effort to make a thing happen. And then once you're there, you, uh, you just, I mean, the, the investments there. So it's so much easier to understand a person and their character. Yeah. Uh, Tiki, have you, have you gotten, you know, anything like that? Have you, I mean, have you felt any connections based off of tabletop gaming? Anything that, you know, sorry, I guess to put it as a question, are there any parts of tabletop gaming that speak to you? Is there anything that, you know, is different to this compared to anything else that you've done? I kind of I kind of chuckled a little bit, but uh, yeah, I agree. I, I see the social contract aspect of it. Just like I think that's why if you go all the way back, me being a, a, a history nerd, I want to say like wargaming, obviously it goes way, way back to the first person drew what we call like a sand table. Like, all right, you know, we're here, then we're there. If we move around here, it should be fine. You know, but even then like traditional wargaming, you know, it goes back to like, I want to say, was it H.G. Wells? Yeah, I think it was H.G. Wells who started doing it. You know, stealing all these kids' toys and making a big like war gaming in his living room. I'm sure his wife was not amused at the time. But um, I, I like the social contract. That's why I think just like old billiards clubs or, or you know, riding real clubs, like that's why I like a club style approach, you know? Um, but as far as what I get out of war gaming, it may sound, I don't know, kind of weird. I don't mean it may sound like that guy, but it's, it's a safe way to show tactics the tactical mindset there's very few ways to scratch that itch and i'm not crazy because i know there's plenty of war games out there you know warcraft starcraft even older like dune 2 all sorts of real-time tactics real-time strategy games that's what it is to war gaming to me it's, it's a tangible way to have a human opponent not a computer that you can exploit you know there's no kiting or anything like that but you know an actual human you know so you can actually test things on and you can it's a non violent way of practicing tactics which is in a sense violence same reason why you know i enjoy playing magfed paintball or you know stuff like that i i even though i'm out of the military and stuff like that it's no longer my business i still like scratching that that tactical itch because it's the oldest competition there is human versus human since the first human's like hey i like your cave and the stuff you have i want your cave you know how am i going to take that cave you know that was the birth of it and that's always going to be a part of us that's where every other sport from football either with your hands or the weird way they play it in Europe with their feet you know no matter which sport it is it all derives from the first conflict so that's what wargaming is it's a safe way for people male and female and whatever have you to scratch that human tactical itch of let's see how this strategy plays out because we always kind of you know regardless of if you want to admit it or not you size people up when you walk into a room you you know you try to decide you know what you could do and this kind of gives you that exact baseline of what you could do, at least on the tabletop with the resources available to you. You. It really like the. It goes back to the social contract aspect of it, where online there is no. This person is physically here. The sizing up of an opponent, the thinking, okay, well, in all of our brains, caveman brain is going to say, well, is if that guy comes at me with a rock. Am I going to be able to take the rock yeah. or am I going to take the rock to the dome? It's, it's natural. It's instinct. And as a little guy, I prefer this type of figuring it out. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you're, uh, you're, we're opposites. Like my fight or flight is, you know, fight because flight is not an option. I, I'm not going anywhere fast. I'm still suing GW for using my likeness with the great and clean one. It's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's whatever, you know. Legal battle with GW. Yeah, good luck with that oh, one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, detach my That's the ultimate war game for them. Name off of all of this. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. But it's, gonna, but the it's also a really constructive and safe way to take that urge, that instinct, and turn it into something productive. Yeah. Where the, exactly like Tiki said, it, it's a natural urge, it's a natural instinct, regardless of age, race, gender, anything. It's just what we do. Yeah, aggression is built into the human condition. And accepting that is one of the first steps into not actually doing violence. Mm -hmm. So when we can say, okay, well, you know, I'm having a really bad day and I need to take this out on something. I, my towel are going to railgun the crap out of your orcs. And I'm going to feel really good about it. And then you're going to come up and say, I'm going to crump them. And you're going to smack me with a cleaver. And then we're going to we're gonna laugh about it. And all that aggression just goes away. Yeah. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. I also, like, so Tiki, you were talking about, like, historically, like, war gaming. 
back in the day, if if my history is correct, and as the history guy, you'll be able to tell me, the way they taught tactics and like you know academy and all that when we're talking like pre World War One, where you know two lines of guys walking at each other, they would have a marker or model of some kind, and you would walk it across the board and say, okay, so if you do this. You're gonna get flanked and you're gonna get killed. Brother, we, I'm about to say, brother, we still do that today. We call it uh, ta- uh, sand tabling. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, yeah. We, we say we, there's a there's a joke saying the sand table, sand table brings out the artist and everybody. Yeah. You, know, you carry a couple of index cards and some and some tape, and you just use what's around. You be like, all right, you know, here's phase line alpha. Here's you know MSR, uh, cores, you know, or, or, or whatever you have, and you can. It's a great way because you use symbols. Everyone can kind of see this bird's eye picture. Yeah. I'm talking from real world engagements to uh, you know little practical you know training exercises you always do a tabletop or you literally call it tabletopping practicals or sand tabling yeah we still use it to this day it's it's invaluable yeah it's it's i mean it's super important and it's it's awesome to me like what you said where it's like sand table brings the artist out of everybody and this is for you guys that are just getting into any kind of tabletop game i want you to understand that if you can get a hold of the rules you don't have to have the specific model or mini or anything like that with your group of guys you can just say hey listen i don't have this model i'm gonna put in this bottle cap and we're gonna use the rules and i want to see or like if you just like, like a gang of high school guys or whatever if you don't have you don't have the disposable disposable income to go out and splash out on a bunch of gw plastic or god forbid forge world resin because it will hurt your wallet you don't have to mm-hmm. you can play the game without having to engage with all that part and find a love for it. But the the artist part, that there's, there's an artist in everybody. And I feel like the, the tabletop and the hobby side of it especially really just brings that out. It's a, it's a great way, and as, as Tiki was saying earlier, like when you are making your models, the hobby side of things, you can take what's in your head and do your best to make it a thing in the real world. I was just about to—I was just about to say before earlier when I was talking about how much that tabletop, that one guy who had the whole thing decked out. I realized how bougie I sound, and that's not where the same thing with you. That's not where I started. You know, like my original. It's okay. I still use you know bowls underneath the uh, the game map for hills. You know, and still use like soda cans and stuff like that. It's it's more about what you have on the tabletop like you said the, the imagination what you have on the tabletop and as long as both sides agree you know same thing i don't mind you know if, if i did take time to you know, paint my army and follow the rules and then you show up with like a gi or like a tonka truck like this is my war truck <laughs> first off it's hilarious and orky but secondly like all right well you know come on you know like as long as you agree for it before ahead of time be like yeah sure no problem but don't be like oh this is my uh, you know, insert whatever Elder Chaos God, and it's just like one Barbie missing an arm. I'm like, come on, man. Like, it took me like hours to build this. Like, or if, you, or if someone has a beautiful table set up, and then you just bring like a, a couple GI Joes, you're like, I get it. You know, no big deal. As long as you check first and just social contract, read the room. You know, don't try not to be that guy. But I understand the bougieness. You don't have to have all that fancy train. You can kind of just like build it yourself. I love DIY stuff. Didn't you say he was in, like the owner of the shop? That yeah, he you was were like the manager, right? The manager? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the manager and he managed a cigar shop before that. And I think he's moved on to other successful endeavors. Super cool guy. He's actually a writer too. Super cool guy. Nice. One of the nicest guys I've ever met in the world. Never screwed me wrong. Never sold me any GW product that I didn't want. And I spent plenty of money at his shop, just like that iconic, great GW manager. Like he's up there in that that tier that people talk about. Super nice guy. Okay, well, it sounds like we need to have him on. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> hey, let's uh, get us his name and yeah. Oh uh, yeah, you know what? I'll reach out. I'll see if he wants to come on. I'm sure he's got some stories. Man, oh, he's a super would... super nice guy. If he's had that perfect setup, oh, I'm sure he'd love to talk about it. Oh yeah, yeah. Because you you ended up, I mean. You walked into a, a Honda dealership and you got showed a Rolls Royce, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> they were showing you the Range Rovers and you're looking for a Honda Civic. I get it. And like I said, I took that love and unfortunately, Mrs. Tiki was a test subject when I did my first Fallout Wasteland Warfare campaign. She gets on and she's like, how am I supposed to unlock this door? And after she says she's a nice person, then just basically like murked some poor guard who was on a smoke break. But hey, you know, things happen. It's the, ap- it's the apocalypse. But she's like, how am I supposed to get past the door? It's like, you got that audio recording. She's like, I actually have to listen to this thing? Yeah, she listens to it. She's like, oh, this is a puzzle. I was like, yeah. She's like, oh, 
this is really in depth. <laughs> I'm like I said, that's my thing. I was a big theme guy, but I got the idea from him. I was like, I was like, yeah, take a look at almost like a murder mystery. It was almost like an escape room built into a tabletop with like war gaming. It, it was it was wildly unnecessary and overly complex, but I loved it. <laughs> but that's what that's what it is with tabletop. Is there are so many different genres. I mean, you can have that escape room built into a tabletop game. You can have just a straight up bloodbath. We're trying to kill each other. Game. I mean, so there's... like, it, and from what I'm hearing, Tiki, uh, Mrs. Tiki, she took the uh, the Thousand Suns uh, problem that you said in front of her, and she treated it with a uh, the orc brain and crunked them. Oh no, not at all. M Mrs. Tiki is like a raptor, like scarily intelligent. But the point is, I designed it where there's like three or four different ways to get the access code to get to the bunker. You could find the key off one of the dead guards. You know, you could, you know, find uh, a lyric written in like a helmet, or you could listen to some of the audio logs and pick up some of the stuff that was changed. There's multiple ways to get past it. I think that's good with any kind of like, you know, dungeon design. Again, I, I did a lot of D&D, so I designed a lot of dungeons that way. But it's just, and that's what I think I like about tabletop versus online gaming. There's no arrow pointing you which way to go. You can't research a wiki real quick. You know, it's like, oh, well, what would I do in this situation? There's no wrong, and I've always enjoyed this, uh, the sand, the sandbox, or the quicksand method where you can do whatever you want, the world is just gonna react to you. You're like, well, I'm just gonna go hire an explosive person to blast open the door. I was like, ooh, you could do that. It's gonna cost money and time, but you can certainly do that. And you also gotta think, well, do I want that door to be there later or not? Yeah, will I need it? Yeah, but, and it's like, the that brings me to something I was thinking earlier. When you're playing tabletop, you're not just playing a game, you're playing the other player. So it's, you don't get that with a lot of, I mean, your traditional video games. The video games, are, they're, I love them, I play them a lot more than I should, but you don't get the, the mind game, the, uh, the little, you know, you don't get to twirl your mustache very much when you're, you know, just running across the map trying to snipe somebody. But with uh, with D&D, especially if you're DMing, you, you place all those little traps and twists and mm -hmm. you can make the world react in a way that with preset system, you're you're just running across a map or whatever, you're, you're not going to get that. But then people can completely throw your whole script for a curveball and as a DM, God bless y'all souls because you're better than I could ever be. If I, if I spent 10 hours trying to design a world or a campaign and then you throw something I'd never even thought of about it, I'm... It breaks your brain. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to think of anything else because I've already spent so much time, but Tiki sounds like you've DM'd before just from the way you've been, you know, talking. That, that puts me in mind of the meme where it's... Uh, I'll see if I can put it up in post. But it's uh, the meme of you enter the warehouse and the guys are playing D and D, and it's like one of the guys asks, "Was well, that like a werewolf?" And the DM's <laughs> furiously scribbling, "It is now." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You, you... yeah, that actually does remind me by far the greatest thing I've ever made. I think I ever made D and I didn't make it. Obviously, I took it from somebody. But the coolest monster there is, because I ran a big pirates camp, like a super cool pirates campaign, was <laughs> a rowboat mimic. And I'll never forget. They're on this campaign. They're running away from a sinking ship. It was basically like a heist mission. They had to steal something from a ship that was sinking and then, you know, messed up an Elder God. So Kraken came, so they're running from that, too. And they're like, oh, there's a rowboat. The first person jumps in and turns into a mimic. I'm like, oh, God, run away. Yeah. <laughs> it gives you something to, Love I mean, it. something like that you will remember forever. That just... Mimic rowboat. You take nothing else away from this. Mimic rowboat. Oh, mimic yeah. rowboats, guys. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> Don't forget it. Row, row, row your boat gently. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, I mean, we've been talking about the different games that we like, what we prefer. Uh, me and you, Tiki, we've talked a good bit. Like, you're, you're a K47 bolt action guy, the more realistic to less realistic, kind of weird war stuff. Like Gaslands, we talked about magic earlier, and I personally don't have any experience with magic. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm open to it, sure, but I'm gonna start shuffling my commander deck. Oh yeah, like, shuffling <laughs> menacingly. <laughs> um, I think I, I think I stopped playing somewhere around. Oh god, what what, what edition was that called? But with the um, uh, the flying ship. Oh man, now I can't even think what it's called. But I was like, I started back in Ice Age. 
you know, old fifth edition. Um, Tempest, there you go. I think that was the last edition I played was Tempest. You know, so like I said, we all had our own colors, and you're exactly right. You know, we're playing tabletop where it kind of resumes, reveals who you are. I was a, I, I like being a tricky person. I like over planning things, having like eight plans for everything. So I was blue. You know, I love my counter spells. I'm like, oh, that's a, that's a super great thing you laid up. Be a shame if someone's uh, <laughs> a blue player. God. Oh, I'll have to look this up. Yeah, my de- my de- I had a blue deck with Merfolk and had a lot of artifacts. They weren't strong, but they just completely just ruined the way the game was played. Just, just constantly messing things up and just threw everything off balance. But to me, it was cool thematically in lore because Merfolk, everyone keeps losing artifacts into the water. You know, it's a blue deck where they would have a lot of artifacts because it all sinks beneath the waves. So it was kind of me- it was kind of like uh, it's really fluffy. I like it. Yeah, that that is you put a lot more thought into that. I went black green. I just I'm I'm making big nasty stuff as big as i can and making your stuff as small as i can yes and that was about my whole game plan that's why i i do orcs in warhammer yeah, and your secondary is uh, like nurgle demons like yeah i'm death going guard yeah death guard orcs i'm going with just smash your face in if if my tactics are terrible, then my face gets smashed in first. You know, and, it, it is what it is. And or the pestilence will take you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love I love 40k. I think ah, I, I played a lot during seventh. I know everyone was like, oh, seventh was terrible. It was, but when you play with a good group and didn't abuse it, it was fun. When you just kind of called out the uh, invisible Death Star stuff, like, hey, don't be that guy. People just played almost thematically or fluffy. It was fun. I had all like an. All, I of course I played Imperial Guard. Um, so I had like an all flyer. I didn't use tanks, I used all flyers. It was a lot of fun and I really enjoyed it. Uh, then in eighth, I started noticing this weird competitiveness things coming. And I think that's when I left. Cause when I started playing bolt action and then conflict 47, it's like playing 40 K just, a l- I, I like the, um, the turn rotation a little bit better. You know, you pull dice out of a bag, so it's randomized. And the other thing, it's like everyone's playing Imperial Guard. So it's not like I have to stare at your weird unit. Like, Tyranids would be the worst. I'm like, is that a, a range unit or a melee unit? It's like, oh, he has a gun. I was like, that just looks like a snotty arm. I can't tell what that model could do. Yeah, is that his tail? Is that his gun? What? What is that? Well, yeah, we're bolt action. I was like, huh, that thing that looks suspiciously like a machine gun with bipods. I bet you that's probably a machine gun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but the Tyranids, is they, oh, oh, he vomits maggots that eat your face. And he just looks like a dude running around with nothing and no armor on, or he just. Well, he's all armor. Yeah, then you have that, that German meme. It's a flaming waffle. What does it do? It waffles flaming. <laughs> like, it's a flaming <laughs> <thing. laughs> I love it. I love it. That's great. So, you, you right now, you're pretty much. Uh, your focus is more on, like, K47, right? Well, funny you mentioned that. If I can steal your airways for a little bit, uh, if you've never heard of Zona Alpha, if you're a fan of, like, Stalker or Metro or stuff like that, that's what Zona Alpha it is. It comes from a book. What's cool, why I got into it during the Plague Outbreak, is it's a good single-player tabletop game because uh, the enemy has basically like an AI written into it. It's what it is. You're going into an exclusion zone, and you're basically pulling out these artifacts. And when you go into it, you take a small team with you. Now, you could stumble into, you know, enemy rebels, you know, uh, thugs, or mutants and dogs. It's, it's kind of like a Resident Evil style mixed with, you know... Uh, stalker or games like that or that new one atomic hearts kind of like that so what i'm trying to do when i'm building within the world of comic 47 is a version of that but it's gonna be kind of bioshock themed because that's the only way i could figure out how to get like an exclusion area so it's going to be like an underwater cities where the germans were doing a lot of their testing on their weird war stuff so you have to enter with like a very limited team yeah you got to run around and steal stuff and of course the the c labs are breaking down so you have a limited time to grab the stuff and make your extraction you know, because everyone likes Tarkov and DMZ, all the extraction stuff. So it's an extraction tabletop game. So you got to run in and grab your stuff and make it out. You know, and you can't use too much high explosives because that could damage the the dome more and it could flood faster. So it's, it's a real big risk reward kind. Of yeah, man, sounds awesome. Now I cannot wait to see the results of that. I mean, I mean, it's like for me, the being the the crazy lore guy. Like I, I sat down and we'll have some more of this on the channel later. I'm developing a uh, like a narrative campaign, not necessarily crusade, but um, a set of battles that take place where you know it's it's almost like playing D and D over Warhammer because you know the what happens now is going to affect the next battle and it will progress and develop that way. And we'll just see where the narrative goes, but. 
I mean, the building of a of a situation rather than just a tabletop. Like, okay, you you got to you can't shoot that way because you're on a spaceship and this thing ain't got atmosphere on the outside. So you got to be careful where you're shooting, what you're shooting. I mean, there's the cost there that you you can't build that into other things like aside from tabletop where you have to think about it. You got a game, you got to play the other person and you got to play the situation. And the I love Warhammer, don't get me wrong, but at Quiet Order, our thing is we don't care what you play as long as you play and we want you to play with us. So I mean, there's there we don't just do 40K. I'm kind of 40K focused, but Tiki is going to be doing K47, uh, Gaslands, Bolt Action, whatever, you know, whatever game you play, you're welcome. And we'll have you know, content over Magic, we'll have content over Bolt Action, we'll have Warhammer, D&D, all that. Everybody's welcome here. Yeah, if you're willing to talk about this, you are more than welcome to join any of our channels in the Discord. You can come in, discuss what you're passionate about. And I mean, I don't know about you, Beardo, Tiki, but as far as myself, I'm willing to learn about, I mean, anything that you have to teach me because like we already discussed, this tabletop is a community built on top of this table. It's something that you can't recreate with any other type of gaming. And if you want to teach me the game that you play, I'm more than happy to learn it. Sell it to me. I mean, if you love it, then sell it to me. Yeah. And, it, you know, I'm going to love it too. Or I might, I might like it enough to, and like you enough, that I will learn that game just to hang out and play the game that you want to play. Exactly. Because if, if you're going to play the game that I like, then the least that I can do is play the game that you like. And I mean... I might not be able to connect with you face to face. I live in the middle of bum nowhere, Georgia. I live <laughs> down here where there's nothing but deer and cotton. But if you live in New York City, I'm sure there is a website. Steam has a massive library of tabletop games that you can play on now. I'm sure there's some way that we can connect and play this game over an actual voice chat, not over a, you only hear me when you kill me, or I only hear you when you, you know, nothing like that, where we actually are conversing the entire time. So yeah, if you have anything that you are willing to talk about or teach people, then you are more than welcome at the Quiet Order. In fact, we have a channel, especially like if you're saying for range and distance, we got a channel that's TTS Hangout, Mm -hmm. And if you've got a game that you want to play, you know, just throw it in there. Say, hey, do you guys know this game? You want to learn this game? Yeah, you know, we can't make it to the tabletop, but I still want to play and yeah. we can learn. Also, I mean, it's a great way for, we've got, I've got some friends, uh, Stax, he's in the Discord, he's great. We've got uh, Hoarding Glory. We, we can't get across the table from those guys as much as we'd love to. We can't get across the pond. Yeah, well, I mean, we could swim, but it'd take a while. <laughs> but it is a long swim. Yeah, it is a long swim. You know about that. But I, like, I did it in a container ship. It took a while. Yeah, <laughs> it takes a minute. Great time for tabletop gaming, though. That's true. There's a reason that most bases are a comic shop. You, uh, with, the, with the pitching and the rolling of the oceans, it might be kind of hard. I mean, the dice basically roll themselves. But I, I take it back. A lot of time games though a lot of magnetize boys magnetize <laughs> magnetize your cars magnetize magnetize it's not very often but if you watch titanic and pause it about you know halfway through you can see the people in the background playing warhammer you know grab their pewter models you know like oh we're in turn four make this ship sink slower <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Let the Imperial Fists off first. They're not ready. Yeah. Oh, man. Save my Mega Knob, please. Oh, yeah. The Forge World model. Put it on the boat. Oh, well, <laughs> the resin floats. It'll be okay. And we'll, we'll find it later. Somebody better. Yeah, somebody better, because that was expensive. But, uh, yeah, I spent too much on that. So, so we've talked a little bit, like... Tiki, you and I, we're we're more the lore guys. So like what's what is the your favorite piece of like 40k or you know K47? I know that uh, Conflict 47 and Bolt Action don't necessarily 
use a um, a very a wide lore. It uses history and just plays on it. Which I mean, when you think about it, history is lore. But what's like, what's your favorite thing that you've read? That cracks me up. Yeah, it's like Morning Glory's channel. He's like, oh, bolt action lore. Like you mean history? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, uh, I won't bore you with the forty seven lore. And that's what that's what dug me into. There's actually some books written out there. Uh, the books actually are not bad. They tell this tale from like one unit. It's actually pretty cool. And a lot of it, what I like is it's grounded in reality, but it's fantastic. So that's what kind of makes it cool. You could be like, well, I've always wanted to fight, you know, uh, I don't know, the VC French against uh, the Japanese, but fighting in Vietnam. Be like, well, that didn't happen very often. Well, it does now. But you can make whatever you want, which is cool. But as far as uh, 40K, my first 40K book, it's still my favorite. And I'm going to get a lot of flack for it. Pardon the pun when I say the title, but it is the Guns of Tanith. I know wasn't everybody's favorite. I loved it. Um, you know, I won't say what happened to you. Know, it's not really a spoiler alert for a book that old, but uh, that really got me into the 40k universe. Like, hey, this is awesome. And like, 15 hours is good and stuff like that. I read a lot of that stuff. But what really got me, and I can't recommend it enough, were the Battlefleet Gothic books. They're harder to find. I think it's like Shadow Point, uh, Relentless, Mortal Fuel. And um, there's another one I can't think off the top of my head. But those books, if you like, you know, big space battles, Battlestar Galactica, Expanse, those Battlefleet Gothic books are so good. The way how space battle is so different in the 40K universe, more than just the Geller fields, like the way that they use, you know, the press gangs and, and ship battles, like it is so cool. I think that's what really dragged me in. And like I said I started with Battlefleet Gothic back in 2007. I think I still have some of my ships. Oh, that's awesome, man. I mean, Battlefleet Gothic is really seems super interesting to me. And as like the first part of the Warhammer lore that I got into, Tanith, man, I love it. The Gaunt's Ghost series was amazing to me. I mean, it's just, oh, it was fantastic. So like, but Jinji, like, I know you're you're more, uh, more being introduced to the lore. I've been putting you through it every time we've hung out. What's your favorite part? I, mm, my favorite part in general, I think it has to be learning really about how much of the big nasty the Tyranids are. They when are they, that. When they attacked Tyrion and was McCrag had his yeah. last stand, mm -hmm. and I think we talked about this in the last yeah, video we talked that about we did. That yeah, I, I I read up on it afterwards. Yeah, and the fact that they are boiling oceans while their ships are landing, that they're sending different waves of just eldritch in, horror. Yeah, incomprehensible, disgusting enemies your way that you've never seen before, that have no sense of self-preservation, that they are constantly at your throat. They are just trying to tear you apart. And then that, of, of course, sent me into, you know, learning about chaos and learning about corn's demons and just bloodlust, thirsty. I don't know. I think there's a lot of things. Reading about, you know, the battle on Terran and McCrag making his last stand, I think that it is, it's just crazy that, what, what's the, what's the low, the slogan, somebody, there's nothing but war. Yeah, in so uh, in, in the Grimdark future, there's no peace, there's only war. I think that's how Baldermore puts it. Yeah, and that's almost, I mean, I mean, I could see that in the next 200 years just on Earth, but can uh, you imagine if we... We don't actually, have ultramarines, it, and the yeah. Tyranids made the ultramarines ultra dead. Yeah, if we actually expanded into the far future, that's all there would be was war. There would not be peace between worlds. There wouldn't be, you might make a, a small agreement, but you're ultimately at war 24 seven. And then having different races, having different, different strengths, different weaknesses, different outside forces, you know, with Torn. showed and, up, the, the yeah, chaos the guys. Having corn, Nurgle, Slanesh with that, all of them. Well, I, th I think what's kind of sad is you mentioned like war and peace. You know, there's a quote only the dead have seen the uh, end of war, but imagine how sad it is for the average Necron. I didn't, I haven't delved too much into that. Oh, I kind of want to because it's interesting. But um, you know, are they just tomb kings with spicy guns or what have you? But when you really look at, it, I mean, these guys conquered the whole world and they went to sleep and then they woke up to another war. I mean, imagine how depressing that is. But then you look at the Tyranids. Are they? Are they the bad guys? I mean, they're just eating everything. I mean, is it is it bad? Yeah, sure. But you know, I was like, that's just that's just part and parcel of the galaxy. Sure, they're intelligent, 
but that's when I, I remember looking at the lore and I, I tried to play a little bit I think back in um, what was the last edition was it ninth yeah I wanted to do because I saw the campaign I thought it was super cool but then nobody was doing it and I was like oh cool wasting some money but I wanted to do the, um, the gene sealer cult narrative like oh this is cool you get to like play in your own planet to like throw over and play in your own cults like this is really cool that no one utilizes sadly but uh, I started reading the gene sealer cult and I'm like you know they're not of all the factions they're not wrong i'm not saying they're the good guys but they're also not wrong and you look at 10th edition it's like oh the fleets are getting closer i was like so the gsc were right i mean yeah sure they're turning their people into aliens but at least they're not lying to them <laughs> you know, it's not like... and yeah exactly. the are close. they're basically just the, the french revolution pick whichever one but you know it's you know overflow overthrow the the ter- like the tyrannical ruler in the Imperium is definitely tyrannical. I mean, it- imagine him, imagine him beating down uh, Horus with four arms instead of two. Imagine how well that fight would have gone. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Careful talking about the Imperium. Uh, well, I mean, you know, the Inquisition don't know where we are. Tiki's handling that. Yeah, Tiki's our. Yeah, he's our. Yeah. yeah, all right. He's our security guy. He might look like a guardsman. But that rosette's on them somewhere. I know it. I'm, I'm just I'm just a GW spy. That's why I shield so much for uh, bolt action to throw off people. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you gotta, gotta keep them looking the other way. Yeah. But so, I, like what you were saying, Tiki, like, Tiki, Tiki, Gingy. Sorry. Uh, it's fine. We look the same. Yeah, yeah. You, your face just really looks like wood with feathers. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> the what keeps me with the lore of 40k is there's no good guy. And with like something like Bolt Action Conflict 47, you can identify with, say, like we're from the U.S. and you wanted to play the U.S. You have this um, like the good guy mentality about it that you know your reasons for why you were there and all of that. And each like every part of the world has a deeper seated knowledge in another part about a faction. Like say if there's a Japanese guy playing Bolt Action and he's like, he knows he, he understands the social context but with 40k the social context is hey the world sucks well i mean counterpoint you can choose almost any faction in 40k and they can i mean hell i could pick the the chaos gods and i could make them out to not be so bad that it's not their fault that's all they've ever known or the tyrannids. Yeah, 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 yeah. I made, yeah. I made that argument about the uh, the night lords. Everyone's like, "Oh, they're terrible. They'll do brutal murders on like ten percent of the population of a planet to get them to surrender." I was like, "Yeah, but they also don't kill the other night." Yeah, so, so yeah, they're bad. Yeah, but in a galaxy full of worlds, that's like I don't know, destroying one city to end a war. No one's ever done that before. Yeah, no, we've never. <laughs> like the Empire of Star. <laughs> we never. The Empire of Star Wars, like the Empire was terrible. They blew up a planet. I was like, in a galaxy full of planets, that's like one city. That sounds familiar. I was like, but did it stop the war? <laughs> no, no, no. So you got to do it. Like, you got to do it twice. <laughs> okay. That's what makes it unrealistic. <laughs> well, yeah, because yeah, you kind of brought it up, so I think we do kind of talk about it. The the whole issue that happened with Bolt Action, the one thing that put Bolt Action on the map, unfortunately, it was like one one uh, one guy's take on it. And nothing, and nothing against the guy or his channel. I'm not going to. You know, take easy shots. It's just not cool. It's, it wouldn't be, you know, gentleman, gentleman like. But uh, he had a take, and he said it, and I can see where people would take that take, especially in today's world, you know. But I, I started with the Japanese army. Do I feel strongly for or against the Empire of Japan? No. Do I have family who fought in World War II who specifically fought the Japanese? Ironically, yes. But to me, that doesn't factor into my war gaming. And I know some people are like, well, I have family. I'm like. I fought in Afghanistan. I was like, so if someone came out and they do have it, you know, if they came out with like a modern day, you know, Afghan tabletop, I'd be like, oh, this is going to be interesting. I was like, watch out for the mountains that are not fun. You know? <laughs> like, oh, this would be really cool to kind of see it <laughs> you know, using technicals, using, you know, surplus Soviet rockets versus helicopter. You know, I would play that game and I wouldn't be offended because it's keeping the memory of what happened alive, you know. And and, and of course, when I was there, you know, I, I did lose people while I was there. So it's not like I had a great time while I was there. It definitely was not a, a club med type situation. But I understand there's a difference between real world and a tabletop game. It's a simulation because you're coming away with experience. Someone played that game and got even just a glimmer of how difficult it was. I'm like, yeah, that's it was a rough, it was a, it was a rough time. You know, it wasn't exactly a, f- a fun time. And so they got to see that kind of tactical mindset, just like I appreciate what happens more at Waterloo or the Alamo 
or something like that when I play these tabletop board games. I'm not trying to recreate it and be like, yeah, take that, you know, whatever I mean. I was like, no, let me get an appreciation of the historical context of what was going on. You know, someone wants to paint, you know, Germans. Say what you want. Did they have great designed uniforms? Yeah, they had Hugo Boss. The guy still makes clothes today and Coco Chanel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they probably have pretty cool clothes. And tanks, yeah, they designed great tanks and great smaller. I feel like I want to collect those. That makes sense. I like to look at Japanese light tanks. That's why I went with the Japanese. I think they're super cool and, and utilitarian, so that's why I use them. It's not a for or against situation. I know some people take that spicy take with bolt action. You can play whatever army you want. It's not a big deal. It's just a game. Yeah, it's the, that takes it back to the kind of the gentleman's agreement thing. We're agreeing to, the, socially speaking, maybe I, I really love the engineering that the Nazis had. They, I mean, obviously the U.S. did too, Operation Paperclip. Yeah. I believe I got that right. Anyway, so, but the the engineering there, like the different, the way they push the envelope, I really love that. Mm-hmm. I do not agree with the moral there. Yeah. But... Like when I'm playing War Thunder, I play as Germany because I like the airplanes. Yeah. You know, and it's and that's got to be okay. That's the part of the agreement that you make that I am not the faction I chose. I find something interesting yeah. about that faction. I love smashing heads in as as an orc player, but I'm not running around just smashing people's heads in and stealing their teeth. Now you do spend a lot of time with your cleavers. I I cut a few animals' heads open a few times a day, but. It's not something that I love to do. It's just something I do. Yeah. You know, it's just that's that is the beauty of what the two of you were both saying is that it is something that you can appreciate a part of it. You can you can have an admiration for what they were going for. You can even admire just the the pure looks of it, just the artistry. I think you don't have to support what I mean, whatever they were doing at the time, that's that's a whole nother conversation that we're not going to get into because that. And I think I'm about to say, I think everybody's scared of taking it to the ultimate conclusion of like, what if someone comes in role playing as their army? I was like, oh, you know, depending on what it is, that could be kind of cool. You walk in and someone's dressed like, you know, Black Templar for 40K. Hey, that's really yeah, cool. Yeah, exactly. You know, or someone's dressed like a sister. But you walk in, probably the person who's not just playing as like the Veermock, but the person who's playing as like an SS unit. Gen- most parts of the world, I want to say 99.9% of them, it's probably not going to go well to wear that to an event. That that breaks the social contract. Yeah, that's what you look at and be like, yeah, sorry. No. And the other thing is, is I've never been forced, and granted, I'm kind of a big guy, I guess, but I've never been forced to play a tabletop game. A matter of fact, I just had a recent game where a guy cheated. I knew he was cheating. You know, around second or third time, I kind of called him out. He still did it. So instead of just like I chose instead of walking away, I just started having hilarious fun with it, like making little pew pew noises and rolling one die at a time and making these grand like, you know, speeches for all my units. Because if he's not going to take it serious, I'm not. No big deal. But if I ever showed up with someone was like that, I'd just be like, yeah, I'm not I'm not going to play like it, you don't have to play the tabletop war games. So if someone break won't meet that social contract, you don't have to play, you know, and I think that's the biggest thing. I- that's a that's a very good way to put it. You don't have to be playing what you're here with. You you can always get up, you can always leave. If you're uncomfortable, if somebody's making it, you know, if, if somebody's even just not being friendly with the game and they're being aggressive, aggressive, then you don't have to be there. Yeah, let them gatekeep themselves out. And Tiki, I think it's funny that you mentioned Black Templars and the Wehrmacht as if the Black Templars are not the 40Ks uh, Wehrmacht. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so the, the, uh, I mean, the big thing there... I feel like that it should be a part of the social contract that like if you're playing bolt action and you play Germany Mm -hmm. and as long as you say, hey, listen, I'm I'm probably going I get into this a lot and I want to dress as like Rommel, you know, Mm -hmm. as long as you're as long as everybody is okay with it, you have to address it. Sure. As long as it's just part of your game then i feel like that should be okay within reason now if you show up there is a guy that showed up to like a gw tournament i think or maybe it was bolt tag it was in spain it was in spain it was in spain yeah i think it was a templar player yeah, around hey, around. Now, he, he came to a 40k event showed up in like a full coco oh, yeah, Chanel. <laughs> full Hugo that was completely out of context. Was now, he playing Death Guard? Was I mean? I, I think he was a Templar player. Oh but wow! Anyway, oh, whatever geez. he's playing. Now, if that had been a bolt action event, then 
he would have had a like a stand on there because listen I'm, if he's playing germany you might be you know you, you might have a tattoo somewhere but you're pushing that role plan pretty far. Well. i'll say what so so here's the ultimate thing and and as i mentioned it is it's just the check like that's what you use the channel for be like hey guys you think it'd be a good idea if i'm no just straight up be like can you legally i don't know probably depending on your yeah. area but should you? Ooh, probably not. And that's what I think it's important. Like you said, it sounds so Sesame Street to have friends, uh, or as the youngsters say, you know, get that vibe check. So I'm like, hey, I'm gonna no. That's a, that's a terrible that's a, idea. Like you should probably. That's get a changed. great way to put. It. And it's and it's up to the people. Yeah, it's the people running the event. Be like, look, I get what you're doing. You know, just like if you brought like an all meme list. You know, well, technically I can. I was like, you're right. Technically you can. No one's probably going to play you, and you're just going to go home alone, and then you're going to write about it on the internet. And people are going to rally either for or against you, and it's going to create this whole huge thing. Like, just, just don't. I mean, you certainly can't. That's the biggest thing. It's like, no one's telling you you can't, but you shouldn't. And if you have friends to, to check with, be like, hey, you know, think about having, you know, I saw one guy. Um, here's a great example a German player for bolt action. And what does he do? Super cool idea. He keeps all his dice, and I think some of his other, like, accoutrements for the game, he keeps it in that very telltale classic german gas mask can you know you see like on every model and every movie that very the classic piece of kit you see on world war ii german soldiers no insignia you know nothing like that it's just an old military surplus piece of gear and I, you see that a lot of people people use like old helmets or old backpacks and stuff like that it's like that's kind of cool you know you're not going full regalia flying flags or saying terrible things it's just a single piece of kit with no insignia on it you know i was like that's that's kind of a a that's what I see more of at, at bolt action events. I have yet to see someone come walking in in full kit of any army. Yeah, that's a very fitting thing to do. I feel like that is, that's acceptable. But again, that's what you said. It gives you, you can bounce that off of a group that you're in and they can let you know. Like, yeah, yeah some countries I think it's illegal. I, I think in Germany, much less in other countries, I think that's yeah. Right. yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not sure about you know other countries like Argentina and stuff. I'm not sure how that works, but you know, some places it's not appropriate. Some places it's straight up jail time. So, you know, your mileage may vary, but no matter what you do, if it seems kind of weird, just get a vibe check for your buddies. And that's why we're here. You know, ask us. We're all yeah. And if you're not willing to do that, you can goose step your back way back out of the chat. You know? Yeah. Good. Like I mentioned earlier, I don't mind who I play with. They can be like from any background. Like I mentioned earlier, like I, someone could dress as a furry. I mean, as long as they could wrap their paws around the dice and actually roll the dice, like I don't mind. But, you know, if you're comfortable in a fur suit on your feet for you know three hours, then by all means, kitty cat, let the tigers and panthers roll down the board and see what happens. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. you know, but yeah, your first sona just happens to be Bjorn the Phil Handed. Okay. Yeah, my works are gonna smash a kitty's heads in. It's, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it works. Hopefully everybody remembers that no matter where you start in tabletop gaming, that this is a community that is not like any other. It's something that it doesn't matter if it you started in Magic or D&D or Bolt Action or Warhammer. Or Overwatch. I mean, it doesn't matter where you come from. Yeah, Overwatch, Fortnite, I don't care where you came from. If you're willing to come here and you know, have this civil agreement that we will all be decent to one another, that we will all treat each other with respect and offer a safe place to one another because that's, God knows it's hard enough to find a safe place that we can all express our emotions and let the things that are eating at you out. If you're willing to come here and let others do that and you do it yourself, then you are welcome in the quiet order Absolutely. That's the whole reason we built Quiet Order, for everybody to have a place to come and hang out, you know, bounce ideas off people, play games, share the games that they like, find people, you know, that might play more obscure games that, um, you know, might maybe aren't in the mainstream, like 40K or Bolt Action, stuff like Gaslands. I mean, Gaslands is very popular, don't get me wrong, but, you know, in our area, that's something that's not usually played, and it'd be great to encourage other games into areas where you know they haven't been seen very much so tiki tell us about your channel man give us a plug howdy howdy like i said guys it's uh tiki um shameless plug i know it's pretty stereotypical but i do have a channel under the same name tiki the hut you know one k and then two t's at the end like i said right now it's mostly uh, conflict 47 stuff uh, i've been a little bit of a hiatus i've been busy i work full time as i mentioned i'm a veteran and i'm also going to school so my time's pretty uh, pretty short, but I try and put out videos when I can. 
Um, but the biggest thing is, as these guys mentioned, is not just is it a space where you can come and talk, but remember to it's it's a place where you get out of your own head and also out of your own house. It's a place to kind of get off the internet, go meet up with some people. Um, like I said I like to call it you know brew hammer or uh, brew actually you know, if you're of age, have some beers, hang out. It's more of a social aspect than anything else. It could be bolt action, could be any game. It's more the people you're hanging out with because it gives you a chance to talk about other stuff, even amongst ourselves before we even you know, record these things. We sit here and just talk amongst ourselves and just kind of see how each other's doing long before we even start this actual podcast. So that just carries on the, the whole point of quiet order gaming. And the biggest thing is disagree, but do it civilly. Some of the things I say you may disagree with, and that is awesome. Let me know down in the comments, be polite and I'll be polite. You know, that kind of sets the tone for the engagement because we're polite here. You know, if you disagree, by all means, tell me what you're thinking because I'm probably going to learn something. And the biggest thing I can leave with is it's always better you know, in a safe and in a safe training environment to lose. When you lose a chest, that's when you actually learn something. <sighs> Next time on the Minotaur and Break Room podcast. Join the crew of the Emperor's Huma as they deal with a precarious gene stealer infestation. Back! Back!